Today is one of the most popular so-called Christian holidays. And understandably, this is probably the very most biblically oriented and sound holiday. There are some sad untruths that are associated with it, but the crux of the issue is very, very important. Our belief in and following of Jesus of Nazareth is central to salvation. So I thought that we would look at some scriptures that are associated with that. The very first one that I want to look at is in Luke 1, verses 26 to 36. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. Now, it's true that Joseph was of the descendants of David. It's also true that Mary was of the descendants of David. It's hard to tell from the original text which is being addressed, but they're both true. Mary and Joseph were both descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at his statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, in our adult Sunday school lesson, we looked at a number of situations where the apostles were puzzled by what had happened, were frightened by what had happened. This kind of thing occurs in the scriptures. Moses was puzzled by the burning bush. There were lots of situations in which God interacted with people, and they were shocked. They were surprised. They didn't quite know what to do. The angel is telling Mary, don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. It's very important to see the mechanics that are explained here. And it's important for us to realize what isn't stated here. At no time in the scriptures does it ever say that God told Mary, I'm going to incarnate into something in your womb. What this says, very frankly, very plainly and simply, is that Mary was going to conceive in her womb and bear a son. And you shall name him Jesus, him, not you shall name me Jesus, you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. This Jesus is also a direct descendant of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. This is a long-term prophecy here. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? She understood it. She got it. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God, because God's power caused Mary's womb to conceive. 
it fits very nicely with what we can see as the science. It's a miracle. How God did that, we don't know. But it certainly has nothing to do with the myth that is very prevalently taught regarding an incarnation. In the next chapter, Luke records that his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. The boy Jesus. Not the incarnated God. the boy Jesus. Now they're returning to Nazareth. The entry slide said, why follow Jesus of Nazareth? I included that because that's where Mary was when she got the message, and that's where they returned to live as a family. That's why he was called Jesus of Nazareth. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And I think most of us have had situations similar to this, where we thought that Liam was with us and started looking for him and couldn't find him, and he was up on the ridge, afraid to come down. But those kinds of things happen, where the adults think that somebody's there and then find out they're not, then the panic, the panic begins to escalate. When they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. I bet they did. And here again, I bet the emotions were running a little high. And it came about that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So there were questions going both ways. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously look looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you are looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? And they didn't understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. That's really odd sentence structure if Jesus was God. But it's very understandable and remarkable as Jesus is growing up. One of the reasons that it says he went down with them, Nazareth is north of Jerusalem. And we have a colloquial uh, tradition that north is always up. But Jerusalem is really high. So he was going down from a city that's pretty high. In the first chapter of Hebrews, looking at the first four verses, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers by the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed 
heir of all things. God appointed Jesus as the heir of everything. Again, very odd language if Jesus is God. Very understandable and plain language if Jesus is God's son, God's heir. On account of whom also he made the ages. God planned for Jesus from the very beginning. And all of the ages have been with Jesus in mind and with the righteous in mind. Paul in Romans 8 says that we are fellow heirs if we are believers with Jesus. Going on about the description of Jesus here, and he is the radiance of his God's glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. You don't inherit something that you already possess. That's the opposite of what those terms mean. Inheriting something is something you don't have, and then you get it. So this is very clear that God is using Jesus as his agent and is appointing Jesus as his heir. Because Jesus did such an excellent job of obeying his God. In Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus answering said to him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We saw in Luke 2 that Jesus kept increasing in favor with God and with men, that Jesus gained wisdom and knowledge. This is a very high bar. I am well pleased. God said about Jesus. Again, this makes absolutely no sense if Jesus is in fact God. But it makes perfect sense with Jesus being the Son of God, the pleasing Son of God, the obedient Son of God. A little, a few days after the event that we just read about Christ's baptism, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He'd just been baptized a few days before this, and the Spirit of God 
had anointed him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The scriptures mention many times that God sent Jesus. This is when God sent him. God didn't send Jesus until Jesus was anointed and appointed. God sent Jesus from Nazareth out into the world, the cosmos, civilization, mankind, his people. Jesus wasn't in heaven and then sent to this planet. Jesus was anointed and then sent. And this is why we need to follow Jesus of Nazareth. Because God said. Matthew 24, or Matthew 4, verses 23 and 25. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him sick, all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy and he healed them. Mental disorders, possession, illnesses, injuries, birth defects, those are all examples of the healing that Jesus provided. But he wasn't sent to heal every human being in every country on the whole planet for all time. This was a sampling. This was an example. This was a teaching tool. But it certainly demonstrated that God had given him authority and given him power. And we'll read in a few verses here just how much power and how much authority God had given him. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. This made a big splash in that era, in that day. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19, there's a very, very specific promise given by Yahweh, Jehovah, to Israel. Moses says, Yahweh your God will raise up to you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brothers, like me. You must listen to him. This is according to all that you desired of Yahweh your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, so that I do not die. They had heard God speaking, and 
panicked and begged that they not have to hear it that way. They wanted Moses to speak for them. This is a promise that there was going to be another prophet like Moses that would speak for Yahweh that would be raised up by Yahweh that they would hear instead of listening to Yahweh. So Jesus cannot be Yahweh. He was raised by Yahweh. He was provided with words. We haven't got to that yet, but that's what the promise is. And that he would speak instead of Yahweh speaking directly to the people. Verse 18, no, 17, Moses still speaking, Yahweh said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brothers like you, and I will put my words in his mouth. Again, this makes absolutely no sense whatsoever if instead what he meant was, I will put my words in my mouth and I will speak to you. If in fact Jesus is God incarnate, that would have to be the way it was explained. Instead, Yahweh is saying, I will put my words in his mouth. And he will speak to them all that I command him. Very clear, very simple language. It's important, though, that we pick up the next verse. And it will be that who's, whoever will not listen to my words that he will speak in my name, I will require a reckoning from him. Now, when Peter repeats this, in Acts 3, he uses a little bit different wording, but he means exactly the same thing. In Acts 3, 22 and 23, Peter says, Indeed, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him in everything that he says to you, and it will be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet prophet will be utterly destroyed from among the people. So why should we follow Jesus of Nazareth? Because we don't want to be utterly destroyed. That's a good, simple point. In John 12, Jesus said, he cried and said, so he said this fairly emphatically, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Now when Jesus uses this contradiction, not on me, it is absolutely impossible for him to be the me, that he's pointing to. If you believe on me, you're not believing on me, you're believing on the one that sent me. Very clear identity. Very clear separate identities. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. 
for I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. These words are so powerful and so clear that Jesus is saying, it's not my words, it's God's words that he commanded me to teach. So we've got both sides of this. We've got the positive statement that they are God's words. And then we've got the negative statement that Jesus says, they're not mine. They're words I was given by God. There just is no question about the separate identities that we're dealing with here. At the end of Christ's ministry, he came to the apostles and said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the singular name, of Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So part of following Jesus of Nazareth is learning everything that he commanded. and observing everything that he commanded. And he made it very clear that those commandments came from his God. He also makes it very clear that all authority and all power are given to him by God. Making disciples is defined as following Jesus, that that's what makes you a disciple, if you follow him. In Acts 2, Peter concludes his talk with, Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God hath made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom ye crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent ye, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> For to you is the promise, and to your children, and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. So in the context of discuss, encouraging them to be baptized, does Peter mention the name of God? I put these things in red. Does he mention Jesus? Does he mention the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yeah. Because those are important ingredients in our faith. 
So when Jesus said to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Peter did that. It's clear that those are not three persons within a Godhead, but those are three important ingredients in our faith. To understand Jesus, you absolutely have to understand God. To understand the Holy Spirit, you absolutely have to understand God because it's God's Spirit. To understand the power and the authority that God, that God gave Jesus, you have to understand the Holy Spirit. All of these are ingredients in the good news, the gospel, reality. Whoever comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It is impossible to please God without accepting the prophet he sent, the son he anointed and appointed. And our understanding of God's spirit as expressed by his son and the gifts of the spirit as decided upon by God and as delivered by his son. These things are important ingredients. In Galatians 3, Paul writes, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We are all sons and daughters if we accept and follow Jesus of Nazareth. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It isn't denying that there's men and women, or slaves and masters, or free or Greek, ethnicities, those things are part of reality. But what it's saying is that those things are insignificant. That by putting on Christ, you become God's family. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. The importance of following Jesus of Nazareth cannot be overstated. It's infinite in importance. The truth of who Jesus of Nazareth is, was, and will be is all part of that faith, putting that on. And the importance of baptism as the acceptance of that faith, that truth, that belief, that gospel, is very clear. It's very crucial. And that's what we must do to be saved. So one has expressed interest in being baptized so as we're singing our last song if you would come forward we'll welcome you song number 171 why not now 171. <clears throat> 
Try to make it a little quicker, or should we try to do two o'clock? 